apparently the silence means we are beginning. Um, good morning and welcome. It's a pleasure to join all of you in celebration of our 32nd annual Spencer Fox Eccles Convocation. A warm welcome to everyone joining us here in person and to those who are live joining us via our live stream from all over the country. On behalf of the entire university, I expend, extend a special welcome to our guest, Ryan Smith. Uh, your innovation, business savvy, and strong investment in communities and higher education around the state make you a perfect speaker for our convocation today. Each year, we gather on this occasion to honor Spence Eccles for the vital role he played in working with his aunt, Emma Eccles Jones, to establish a $15 million endowment that has benefited this business school since 1991. That generous gift and the naming of the school pay tribute to Mrs. Jones' father and Spence's grandfather, David Eccles, one of the leading figures in the economic growth of both the state of Utah and the entire Pacific Northwest at the turn of the century. We are honored that the David Eccles School of Business bears the name of this great entrepreneur. The David Eccles School of Business has experienced remarkable growth and achievement in the past decades, and a critical part of that has been a product of the Emma Eccles Jones um, endowment. The funding in that endowment gift has provided more than $25 million to the business school. Um, we've had those funds that, it, that have enabled us to develop innovative programs, offer scholarships to top students, and to help retain and attract nationally recognized faculty. It has been a catalyst for excellence throughout the school, and we thank Spence and also the other members of the Eccles family, Lisa and Hope, who are here with us today. Um, we're so grateful for your continued support and encouragement. Um, I'm now pleased to introduce Spence himself, the grandson of our school's namesake, David Eccles, and perhaps the University of Utah's most ardent fan. Spence graduated from the U in 1956 and went on to earn an MBA from Columbia. For new, nearly two decades, he was chairman and CEO of First Security Corporation, which was, until its sale to Wells Fargo in the year 2000, the largest banking organization in the Mountain West. Spence recently celebrated his 88th birthday at an age when most folks are relaxing. Spence continues to serve our community through both his time and his funds. How grateful we are to have this remarkable man as um, part of our community and giving back so much to the university and the rest of the state. Spence, the community we call home is a much better place because of you. You give 110% every day and are an example of how devotion to family and community can make a, a huge difference and lead us to success. And now I'm gonna turn the time over to Spence himself, the man who ensures that the best is yet to come. Spence. Well, good morning, folks. Uh, and thank you, Dean Hayes, for your gracious introductory to this 88-year-old 110% uh, Ogden banker. That's pretty good. But it, that notwithstanding, I'm thrilled and honored, as always, to welcome all of you to the annual Spencer Fox Eccles Convocation that for 32 years now, once again begins the new academic year for the students. And each year at this event, I find myself reflecting upon the accomplishments of my grandfather, David Eccles, and his remarkable journey. In 1863, as a 14-year-old impoverished Scottish immigrant boy to become one of the most successful industrialists and business entrepreneurs of the Western United States. And I'm also mindful at this annual event of the generosity and the foresight of my Aunt Emma Eccles Jones, whom I guided to establish her generous endowment in her father's honor and memory that continue to enrich the school today, as the dean has mentioned. I truly believe that my grandfather and my Aunt Em would be proud of the legacy this school has created through 
educating, mentoring, and shaping the futures of tens of thousands of students. Today, there are nearly 40,000 alumni living in all parts of our nation and the world where they are now leaders in business and industry. So it's only appropriate that I celebrate David Eccles' legacy, business savvy, tremendous work ethic, and yes, unbelievable entrepreneurial spirit by hearing today from another one of Utah's most outstanding business entrepreneurs, Ryan Smith. As you'll hear in his conversation with President Randall, Ryan is truly an entrepreneur, the kind we hope you students will be inspired to become during your time here at the David Eccles School of Business. You know, Ryan came up with a great idea, I understand. The story goes, Qualtronics. When he saw a need and found a creative way to fill it, and while it took years of hard work and determination and, yes, entrepreneurial drive, he achieved amazing success. And now Ryan, now Ryan, through your ownership of both Real Salt Lake and my dear to my heart, the Utah Jazz, we're coming, counting on you to once again su succeed. <laughs> well, it seems like yesterday to me, it was more than 40 years ago that I uh, first worked closely with the original jazz owner, Sam Battistone, who brought the team to Utah from New Orleans. And then I worked with Larry Miller to keep the Utah Jazz here in Utah when times were tough. But that's a real story for another day. But Ryan, thank you so much for being with us today and we're excited to get your perspective on business, entrepreneurship, professional sports, and more, much more. And President Randall, oh yes, so nice to see you. <laughs> we're delighted that you'll be moderating this discussion this morning, because speaking of entrepreneurial impact, that is definitely what you brought to the David Eccles School of Business during your fantastic 12 years of leadership here as dean. And now, now what we are so fortunate you are bringing to the entire University of Utah as its new president, with your energy, your spirit, your enthusiasm, and oh yes, leadership talents to go with all. So now, President Randall and Ryan, it's all yours, take it away. Welcome. It's exciting. Spence, how are you? Which side are you on? All right, great. Well, I have been wait looking forward to this day for a long time. Ryan is one of my favorite people here in the state of Utah. So let me give you like the quick synopsis. Here is somebody that took a Utah-based company, Qualtrics, to uh, $8 billion when it was, or excuse me, an $8 billion acquisition when it was acquired by SAP. I think the largest acquisition of any software company we've seen in the state, perhaps in the world. A massive, massive undertaking. They later flipped it around and took it public again. Um, he's been involved with this company, I think, since it started in a garage. Um, he doesn't know this story, but I was traveling back from, uh, I was actually traveling back from uh, Hong Kong. I happened to be sitting next to his father uh, on, on, on the plane, and I heard all about the early days of, uh, of, 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 of Qualtrics. Um, and I'm just gonna tell you, it was, it was gritty. It was gritty, and they, they, they pulled it off. Of course, you know him now, as uh, he and his wife Ashley uh, purchased the Utah Jazz but they also are trying to tackle cancer. They founded a cancer charity called Five for the Fight that's doing really, really remarkable things. And then he also sponsors some remarkable scholarships that have been given to over 100 students here in the state of Utah. The Utah Jazz Scholarships, full tuition, room and board to the six, I think, six different colleges here in the state. It's actually just transformative. We may have a few of those scholars here in the office. We wanna stand up really quick. We've got one right here. So great to see you. All right. 
So with that, let's get into some let's get into some questions, and the audience will certainly have uh, will certainly have some time as well. Ryan, we've got students out here. Take us back to your days. Uh, I believe I'm even going to say it at BYU. Uh, <laughs> by the way, that's I think that's the first president that said that right here. Uh, anyway, but anyway, at BYU, tell take us back to those days. Did you see? Did you see yourself as owner of the jazz, owner of a, a billion dollar valued company when you're sitting in those seats? So first, um, <clears throat> can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, so first it's cool to be up here. Spence, like, this is legendary. <laughs> like, it's like, I, I hope like you're all having a good time, but for me the highlight <laughs> is to hang out with Spence. <laughs> Like, when I grow up, that's what I want to be like. And, like, the impact that him and the Eccles found, it is so inspirational, okay? Um, second, um, Ashley, stand up. <laughs> this is my wife, Ashley. So, you, can't, you can't talk about school without Ashley because she's pretty much the one who got me through it. Uh, and then third, uh, what a treat with, with President Randall. Um, I'll never forget when we were working at Qualtrics. It must have been we first met maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. And I get a call that the dean of the business school of the U wants to come down and talk to me about who we're hiring, because we were hiring a lot of people, and what he can do to develop courses, new courses that don't exist, so that the students will be prepared and we will hire U of U students. Think about that. That's vision. And I just know that for my children or whatever, like, you guys are super lucky that you've got a dean that cares about you as much as, as President Randall does. And so, huge, 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 huge fan. And whether it's what we're working on in the community or the jazz scholar, it's just the answer is yes. And life's so much easier if you just say no. It's hard to say yes. Well, that was, that was kind of you, Ryan. By the way, Ryan immediately hired two of our students from the, from the U, and I didn't even have to put those classes into place. But we did. <laughs> but we did. So that, there's somebody that says yes, yes, yes as so well. So back to, I think you asked me the question. Do you uh, want me to read like, it? Well. Yeah, no. like. I'm not supposed to be here. Like, I grew up, my father was a professor at BYU. My mother was um, an academic. She grew up, she was one of the only people in her family to go through college. She grew up in Palo Alto, California. She joined the, the LDS church there and came out to BYU Hawaii, ends up going to BYU ends up putting my dad through graduate school because she could type really fast. As she was raising five kids, all within like a seven year period, she decided she was gonna go get her MBA and then went on to go get her PhD. And as a little kid watching your mother walk the stage as the only female getting her PhD, um, that's inspiring, right? Um, you know, my parents divorced when I was young and I ended up kind of taking a pretty rocky path. Like, I, I dropped out of high school. I had a 1.91 GPA in high school. Not really college material. Um, it wasn't because I wasn't a smart kid. I just, life hit me, and I didn't want to do anything. And so I'd just rather play golf, and, and I just didn't care very much. And then I ended up meeting some friends and some people who said, hey, you should go teach English in Seoul, Korea. So as a 17-year-old, I packed up with two of my buddies and went to Seoul, Korea. My father at the time had, you know, basically said, well, nothing's going to get worse than he's already at. Like, <laughs> no, no further down you can go. And ended up really, I ended up living there for three months, ended up moving in with four people from Utah who I met in the subway and ended up deciding to serve an LDS mission, came back from my mission and said, hey, I want to go to college. And then I was like, oh, wait, I, I got to go get a GED. <laughs> then I got to go, like, that GPA is not very good. And 
I came back and I took one year at UVU, um, the only place that would let me in. Got a 4.0 and um, got accepted to BYU. Worked my way into the business school there. Um, ended up graduating with like a 3.7 GPA um, while starting a business and doing all of that. And so, and then if you look at Qualtrics and you look at our story, like I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> like, and so I think if you look at how, you know, hopefully we, we treat this as like, there's a reason why we're doing the stuff we're doing and we're constantly looking for that every day. And um, I've, I've told, I told a group earlier that like, I think as Ash and I raise our family and we raise our kids and we've asked ourselves like, what do we care about? Like, what do we deeply care about? And I think this is a question that every one of you need to ask yourselves. Like, what do you care about so much that you will fight for it? And, and that's hard because I think we're in a world right now where like, it's cool not to care about anything that you'll fight for. Like, where are your lines? And I care about my family that I'll fight for it. I care about my faith that I'll fight for it. I care about Qualtrics, right? I care about the jazz. <laughs> and, and I care about Utah. And this is a huge, you guys are all a huge part of Utah. And, um, and that's kind of a little bit of direction how we make decisions. Yeah. So, I will tell you, um, Ryan, I do go back about 10 years. And the one consistent thing I have heard from you, Ryan, is you wanted to build a company in this state that was enduring. Tell me a little bit about uh, the early days of Qualtrics and why you just decided, you know, we're going to build it here. Because you had choices, I'm sure, many times over the years to move somewhere else. Yeah, I think, I think if I look back at like why and where that passion came from about this state, I, I, don't, I don't know. Like you, you kind of have it and it feels, it feels right. I think it's part of it's like the origin of our state. Like we're fighters, we're entrepreneurs. It was super messy and like it's, it's awesome though. Like no one has a story like we have. And like it's inspiring to say like, wait, what if you could be a part of like moving it along and like taking the baton? And I look at like Spence, I look at like, these are people who are actually taking that baton. And very rarely do you get a chance to make an impact on a whole state. And the cool part is we're still a startup. Yeah. Right? Um, and people are like, well, you don't have this, you don't have that. Well, yeah, of course. We're like, you know, 200 years old, like less than that. Like, okay, give it some time. We'll, we'll get, yeah, we can solve that. Like, but what we do have is like this amazing, this amazing culture that we can go build and accomplish things that are, where it's in our DNA. And that's contagious. And that's why so many people are moving here. So there's, there's that piece. But when we were starting Qualtrics, you know, my father was the one that originally had the idea of Qualtrics, but he, he was an academic, and his idea was just to create a product to share with the students. I was working in LA, I came back, he ended up having cancer, and I said, I'm gonna stop school, I'm gonna work with my father, and just be with him. Well, I went through his treatments up at Huntsman, and um, he was working on this idea, so instead of fixing up a car, we decided to do a little tech company and like <laughs> we split the money 50-50 if it came in. And I think his expectation was probably that it wouldn't do anything. And I, I was kind of like unlocking this, you know, if you think about the experience that I've had up to this point from Korea or I was, I was on a high. I was like, okay, there's nothing we can't go do. And we started building it brick by brick. His only rule was that we couldn't take venture capital. So like this is a hard like, talk about being up against a, a kind of a bad hand. You're with your father, you're with a basement, you're in Provo, Utah, and no venture capital. Ready, break. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not that's not how you would draw it. Then to compound that, the only people that would buy our product were academics. And you're all great. We're cheap, though. You have no money. Yeah, that's like, right, good point. And <laughs> you have all day long and nowhere to go. Yeah. So you could hang out in our product 
all day. I was like, don't you have something else to do than call me and tell me what's buggy with our product? <laughs> you and, know, you should see my inbox. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, so you look at that as a business model and you're kind of like, most people just ran away from it. And what happened was we operated in our basement. We had to be cash flow positive where we had to make money because that was the only way we could pay ourselves. There was no other lifeline that was going to exist. So that, that theory of constraints actually caused us to build a business that we would want to keep. And what I see so much in tech is like, oh, I'm going to build a business that I can sell. Well, if you're building a business to sell, I don't want to buy you. I want to buy a business that you want to keep. And then it's actually a hard decision. And so does everyone else. When we acquire companies, we're acquiring people that like, it's their baby. And they feel that way. And so a lot of businesses now are, are set up just off the wrong premise to start with where the mindset is. Okay? Our only option was to go through. And so we, we left our basement in 2006, which was a horrible time. You got the academic market. You're leaving the basement. You're coming into the m most insane you know, economic situation that I've experienced in my lifetime, which was 2007, 8, 9. And for us, as a non-venture-backed company, calling on the academic market, it wasn't looking very good. And we just got out over our skis, and we had about 80 people. Well, two things happened. Number one, everyone who was in the job market where unemployment was high went back to school if they were young. Because that was like a, that was a rest stop. They were worried about the resumes. They all went back to school. Grad schools went up. And everyone got trained on Qualtrics from the academics with no money. And then as we came out of 2008 and 9, these students started graduating and taking Qualtrics with them. How many of you use Qualtrics? I mean, look at this. Like, and it hasn't stopped since. And that's been this brilliant idea now as people look back and there's case studies written about, oh, Qualtrics going into academia. It's like, if you only knew <laughs> like how bad of a model that was. And like, it worked, but that's all we had. So in 2012, um, things started to move and we felt like we need to raise venture capital. Well, my father and my brother said no. I had recruited my brother back from Google. He was running Google China. He was an early Googler. And the capital part of this was just inhibiting us for really letting go. And we weren't running the business the way we should. I remember going out to the Bay Area, meeting with Sequoia Capital and Mike Moritz, who gave Steve Jobs his first dollar, Larry and Sergey their first dollar. And I've got a meeting with them. And I'm staying, in, I'm staying in a hotel next to Stanford campus. And I wake up in the middle of the night because I had a nightmare that we, in order to take venture capital, we would have to move the company to Silicon Valley. And I couldn't go back to sleep because I was visualizing recruiting our students out of Stanford, doing all, the whole model broke. And I didn't want to move. And I knew that Sequoia had not invested in a company really outside of the peninsula. And at the time, and I go in the next day. With this, at the time, we have an offer to sell the business. And Mike Moritz at dinner looks at me and says, why are there so many companies in Utah that could have been something great but sold out too early? I was like, he's like, like, and he just started listing them. The second an offer came in, people would take it. He knew I had an offer. And we looked around the table and kind of said, and he, and he asked a question. He said, do you want to be relevant long-term in tech or do you want to be one of those companies? I was like, I want to be relevant, right? Like, what are you going to say? Of course. <laughs> You're staring across from him like, I want to be relevant, right? And then he said, I believe you can do it. 
And I believe if you do it, you can do it in Utah. Really? And Amazing. that was all I needed to hear. And I had a wife who was like, well, what are you going to do if you sell anyways? Like, you're not going to be around the house more. <laughs> like, <laughs> just go. And between those two things, like, we didn't look back. And it's always been a thing. Like, if he can tell me we can do it in Utah, that's all we need. Like, we can do it in Utah. And so if you look, we raised one of the largest Series Bs. We raised the largest Series C. We were going to be the largest IPO. Um, and then we sold with the largest private enterprise software um, acquisition, not just in Utah, but anywhere out of Provo, Utah, out of that basement, out of the academic market. And so I think that for me, and, th and then everyone said that it's over. Like the story's over. And we had 30% of our employees leave. We had everything. We'd been acquired. The show's over. There's no more Qualtrics. This is like you get rolled in, you change your name. Like, and I was like, no, that's not how the story goes. And then we worked with SAP and we just IPO'd. And I was at a dinner last night with our executive team, like trying to carve out the next five years of what this could be. And so I'm super lucky. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people who are a lot smarter than I am. Um, I don't know, there's magic here in Utah, and like it's, it's part of it. But at every turn, people have said, like, well, you can't do it here. You can't do it here. Oh, you're going to have your big user conference. You can't have it here. Go to Vegas. Vegas is calling. Well, you have to have it in Vegas. And it's like, no, Barack Obama's coming to Utah. <laughs> Michelle Obama, Oprah Winfrey. Like, no, they're coming to Utah. This is where we're going to bring these people. And that's, that's a big part of who we are. It's an amazing story. I mean, and I, first of all, I just want to thank you for everybody here for maintaining the investment in the state of Utah. You've made several. I'm going to start with a small one that you make all the time. Many people don't know that uh, we're looking at also Professor uh, Ryan Smith. He teaches a class on uh, leadership and decision making. What kind of advice comes out of that class? Because like I said, he, he gives of his time. He invests in, in the future leaders of, uh, of our state by, uh, by this venture. So t t tell us a little bit about the class and what, what, what you try to give the students. Well, I think, I think that this, this started, um, and we had talked about this a lot, like Qualtrics is a story that there's a lot of case studies that are written about. I think we have two or three at Stanford where I had been out there, and um, we do a trip to HBS to give a case study on go to market. And I was coming back with like four Utah people, and we're like, why, are we, why aren't we in Utah doing this? And so we approached, um, we approached BYU to start with and said, hey, we want to do a class, and I, I'll extend the same offer to you. I don't know how that How many would like to go to a class right, hosted right. by, all right, OK. Um, Sign up afterwards. <laughs> but like, like, it's really important, because what we do is we've kind of changed the way academic, how we learn. Like, this is in the business world, like when we want to go get educated or pay money to go to a big conference, this is how we learn. Two people get up, they talk about real life experience, you're sitting there, whether it, it, it is actually helping you or not, your brain is going somewhere. Every one of you is thinking about a problem or something you have, write it down. I'll never forget sitting in an environment where I heard from a head of a funeral home director in this type of a setting, talking about the experience they're trying to provide every day when they're hosting a funeral. Like, imagine that. Like, I'm hosting an experience of everyone in the room's worst day. Like, and I was like, wait. Like, and it fundamentally changed the way we have viewed our call center and our support model at Qualtrics forever. But I didn't really have anything that applied to death, but I took that and went to a different level. So that, that is how I believe that we can be helpful. And then if we think about what's covered in the class, it's like decisions and compounding decisions. I know a bunch of really, really smart people who are probably too smart, but their decision making is not great. And um, 
a lot of times in academia or at universities, we learn what people did and we try to emulate that as opposed to maybe how they think. Because if you have in your tool belt like a view of how someone else would tackle a problem, no matter what the answer is, is just how to get through that, that's something that everyone can learn through real life experience. And we ask, you know, we'll bring in 15 lecturers in a similar format like this, and we ask the same, we tell their stories, but we ask five questions. And we want to know, first of all, about, um, you know, grit and like how we, how we fight through friction. Because, and I have a lot of stories around this, but like if, if we wouldn't have fought through a lot of that friction at Qualtrics, the outcome would be totally different. So how do you know when to fight through it or when to take the off-ramp? And one of my big concerns is if you want to talk about friction, um, I'm sure Spence could write a book on friction in life and at a different level than we're, we're accustomed. Life's, life's pretty easy right now for, for most people at a, at a level. Like, uh, there's a lot like on demand with technology and things that have made it easier. And so when stuff gets hard, you jump off and nothing good is going to happen without friction. And so I'll just ask one question from this group, and this is totally off topic. Um, I want everyone in this room to think about something they're super proud of. They've accomplished. Just something they're super proud of. Like who, someone raise their hand. What are you proud of? Was that easy? Amazing. Who else? The music you made? Um, tell me more. And is it hard? Is it hard to kind of get creative and go through that? Yeah, and so, so I could go around the whole room and we could go through this exercise. Um, no one will say something they're proud of that they haven't had to fight for. And so if you know and by hearing that from 20 different people in their life and thinking that, oh, well, they started here, they're here, actually, there was friction to get there. And if you know that, by the way, I'm living life because I want to be proud of whatever it is that we go do, like, it's pretty easy to see that everything that's worth something is going to require a battle. And if you know that going in, when the battle comes, you don't jump ship. Um, and probably the biggest regrets I have, we could go through that same thing, what are you least proud of? It's a moment when you've exited, because you thought the battle was there. I'll never forget going on a bike ride at a conference. We go to this conference, we're in Aspen, it's Fortune Brainstorm, I'm invited. And one of the activities was go ride your bike with Lance Armstrong. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, oh my word, like, you gonna ride with Lance Armstrong. And I'm not a big cyclist, but I have a road bike and I'll go. So I brought like my seat and my cleats and I'm like, oh, I've got an advantage, we're at altitude. And <laughs> like, I'm gonna go do this. So there's like, there's like 15 of us that take off with Lance and 
I don't know how far the trail is. I don't know anything. And like we get going, and we're going up the hill. We're going up the hill. And I'm like, I'm right on this guy's tire. Like, how good can he be? And then like we keep rolling, and we're rolling, and we're going up, and we're going up, and we're making turns. We're going up, we're going up. And I start feeling like a little queasy. I was like, OK. We keep going a little further, and um, I was like, I'm going to throw up. I'm going to absolutely throw up. And about this time, he takes a phone call. <laughs> and I was like, oh my word. And I just got to the point where I was like, I can't go any further. Like, I can't go any further. And I just kept going and going and going. And finally, I just dropped out. I dropped back. And then there was like three other people that go, well, that night, we were all talking about how we went on a ride with Lance. But those three people were telling a different story. They like rode with Lance. And I was like, on the ride with Lance? And the craziest part about it is like two more turns was the finish line. And a lot of times, that's what happens in life. And I would love to be able to tell the story that I actually finished with Lance. And I didn't, and I can't. So there you go. An amazing, amazing story. Uh, I rode the Alpe d'Huez a few years ago. Um, when I started, I was given uh, Lance's time and Cheryl Crow's time. At, at, the, at the moment, Lance was dating Cheryl Crow. And I hung with Cheryl Crow pretty good <laughs> until, the last, until, the last, <laughs> until the last turn. Anyway, glad you pivoted to sports, uh, because this whole audience wants to know what in the world is going on with the Utah Jazz, and I am just gonna, I am just gonna, I'm just gonna let you take this wherever you want. Uh, I can ask the hard questions, or I can just let you you run with it from wow. here. The first live discussion about the Jazz post trade. <laughs> do we have any Utah Business School? Everybody, turn no. off their cell phones yeah, at yeah. this point. <laughs> that doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> so look, I mean, I think that uh, first of all, like the gravity of uh, being in the position that we're in with the Utah Jazz is not lost on us, OK? I think, I think it's important there. I think there's a, probably a lot of people that are like, do these people care? Do they? I promise you no one has experienced, um, as a sports franchise, like what we've, like, let me phrase it differently. Uh, like, I've been there through all those losses. <laughs> I've been there through it all. Um, it's very rare to be in the position we're in growing up with the team that you grew up watching. It almost, I mean, Adam Silver is like, Ryan, this never happens. Um, we want to bring a championship to Utah. And the amount of pain that we will probably go through to get a parade is, um, is, is interesting. Like, <laughs> because I think that is like something that everyone and, and Spence, in your lifetime, like, how do we, how do we, how do we do this? Um, when we came into the team, it was like we were one of the top teams. We weren't quite the top team, but we were one of the top teams. And um, the decision wasn't easy, but it was doable. And we had to keep the team together. And we were fifth in payroll. And that, that's an easy move. I mean, to be fifth in payroll, I don't know if the Jazz have ever been that high in the league in payroll. And, we put all that together. Um, it's easy to do that. It's hard to say, hey, look, how do we go? And, we, and we've had an eight, a great eight-year run. Um, it's hard to say, hey, how do we plan for the future as well? And so you can control some of that. And some of that is controlled, is kind of on you, depending on timing. Um, and so I think we're in, we're in a spot right now where we're really thinking like, OK, how do we, how do we build something that we can actually get there? And so if you look at some of the changes that we've had, we've got um, a phenomenal, probably one of the top young coaches in the league that we are excited to build around And Will Hardy. He's 34 years old, right? And I love everything about Will. Um, but I think the biggest thing for me is just Danny Ainge coming in. Um, Danny has been a friend for a long time. He's the most competitive human being I know. And um, what he brings to the organization is truly um, this idea that like we're trying to go win a championship in a very competitive market and, and the process of what that looks like is maybe different than 
um, where we've been. And, and um, there's no guarantees, yeah. right? Even you see players all the time saying, hey, I'm going to go jump on that team because I'm going to win a championship, and they take seventh, <laughs> right? This happens all the time. And so I think what we're doing is just um, – trying to make the best decisions we can with the hands that we're dealt and like go and build out. And I'm, I'm excited for, I'm really excited. If I was a Jazz fan, I'd be super excited because when we came in, the same way that Cleveland just pushed all their chips in on the Donovan um, deal, um, we had done that in the organization to go bring in Mike Conley and some of those other things and really spent and gone for it. And for whatever reason, we didn't quite get to where we are. And so I think, I think we're, um, I'm excited. We have, uh, I think, the most future first unprotected picks right now in the entire NBA. Um, I think we've got a good young squad um, that is exciting. I mean, in the Cleveland um, trade, I think we picked up, uh, you know, obviously three unprotected first round picks, but we also picked up three lottery picks that, that were coming over. And, and time will bear these decisions out. They're not clear. You never know. I think if you think back to Danny and the and the and the Brooklyn trade, you would have never known that that would have turned into Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, right? And so, um, it's probably all I can say. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's not super complicated as to like how it's going to be, and and you also don't know. If you would have told us last year when we brought everyone back and we went in after coming off, you know, a, a, a Clippers loss in and not being healthy, that, but just by being healthy and bringing everything back, you would think, like, we should be the contender then to finish where we did. It's, it's hard. And I think you saw the same thing um, with the Phoenix Suns, right? They go out and win the regular season and come out and they get knocked out, like, right away. So um, sports is tough, but I think if you're, if you're building something for the long term and you really want to go, um, I think we're, we're in a much better spot. Um, right now for the future than where we probably were. So the interesting, I, to me, as I look at the jazz, you're, I guess, small to medium market, certainly a, a, a growing market, competing with, I mean, the dollars that are coming out of LA, for example, right? I mean, Steve Ballmer appears to be willing to spend anything to win a, win a championship. You seem to be doing this in a different way. Give us, underneath the intense desire to win, there appears to be a pretty clear logic that you're going to do this the entrepreneurial Utah different way. Can you give us any insights into how you're thinking yeah, about so it? Yeah, so first of all, I don't believe that Utah is a small market. Um, we can go down and look at the small markets in the NBA. And... There's not many of them that can host an Olympics. There's not many of them that you can jump on a plane 15 minutes from the arena and wake up in France, or soon to be Korea, soon to be or London. Like, that just doesn't exist. And I'm not going to name names, but I can go through these small markets. There's not very many small markets that are um, lowest unemployment, right? Um, three of the fastest growing cities, six out of the last 10 years. Um, now, whether those markets are, whether Utah is showing up that way is another story. And so I think part of our job is to go and say, wait, we have all this here. When I grew up as a kid, like you'd come from Provo to Lehigh and then you'd hit like past the prison and like there was just like massive gaps between that right now. like. You start like down south, and it's one connected city all the way up. And not only that, you've got, you know, as we speak right now, 50 celebrities and 50 CEOs sitting up in Park City at any time. And so the real power of Utah is how do you bring that together? And, um, we just moved into the top 10 and led the NBA in new sponsorships over a certain dollar amount out of Utah um, because of the growth, because of who wants to be a part of it. Um, we just brought in UFC. I was there. It yeah. was amazing. So 
uh, that was an interesting. Not particularly academic, but yeah, it was yeah, amazing. Yeah. That was. Uh, <laughs> That was an interesting thing. We never had a pay-per-view fight. Um, one of my investors in, in Qualtrics, Egon Durbin from Silver Lake, is also the largest investor and took Endeavor Public, which owns the UFC, and we said, hey, like, let's get a fight. Um, we worked with the Utah Sports Commission, who they were talking to all the time. We ended up getting that here, and then you know, Dana came through and said, I'm going to give you, like, we had to have a top card. And that was a big leap. Like, if you build it, will they come? They did. And we stack ranked with Houston and other markets and had one of the most epic experiences, which, um, I mean, for four minutes of that fight, like, you didn't think something, I mean, 60 seconds left, and it was an epic experience. And so what a, how do you keep building on that in all areas? We're hosting the All-Star Game. Like, what does that look like? What, what is actually the experience of Salt Lake? Like, and I'm challenging you, like, what is your play in All-Star? Like, what's the you gonna do? It's your moment too. Right. Like, I expect something super radical to come out of you. <laughs> like, if you guys don't it have will. concerts, if you don't you, have concerts will. going on every night, Spence, like, I love the school, <laughs> but I want your All-Star concerts in Rice Echo Stadium. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, Every ski resort, everyone needs to, we need to activate the city. When we did the Olympics here, it was everyone activated everything. Like every store owner moved out, like everyone Airbnb'd everything they had. Like what, what's our equivalent of that? And like we activate. And so I think we're working through that and saying like how do we, how do, we do And it's not that we want to change Utah. Um, Utah's like, growing and it's happening. We don't need to bring, like, it's not like we're trying to bring more people. More people are coming. We're out of houses. Like, it's happening. That ship sailed a long time ago. Um, the secret's out. You used to come here and, like, then you would leave because there was no industry. Now people are going, well, wait, I can work from anywhere. And with wellness becoming such a big part of your lives and all of our lives to get away from the madness and unintended consequences of the internet, like, there's not a better spot than Utah. There's just not. And I, I live, I mean, I go everywhere. Like, this is where I want to be home. And so I think that the, the future is bright when it comes to where we do that. Now, how do you use that and then compete? Um, look, like, it's, it's definitely worked for the Warriors where they've really leaned in at, like, a, a level that is unheard of, um, it hasn't worked for the Clippers historically, and they've leaved in. Um, Boston Celtics were right at that um, luxury tax line. They didn't even go into the tax this year, and they, they made it to the finals with that team that Danny built. And so, like, it's about a team still and working. That's what's so beautiful about sports in the NBA, is like, we can go put that together. And that's exciting. Yeah. By the way, every year I learn something from the speakers at this convocation. I just want you to take note of what Ryan just did, because this is something I learned from him probably about seven years ago when he came and spoke. He has this incredible ability to see the positive future in the situation that he has. And that is, in my mind, sorry, this will be my judgment on you, but I think that is that is part of your secret sauce, Ryan. It's amazing. I learned that from you, and I hope I can put that into practice. We have got a few minutes. I want to take some uh, questions from the audience. I, I want to say one more thing. Like, I was just thinking here. Can I do that? Oh, yeah. So, this is a little story. So, I see Susan here. Like, we started a foundation about the Jersey Patch of Five for the Fight. And... We were talking with the Huntsman organization about, like, that's where my father's cancer was. Like, um, really, like, the treatment saved his life because of cancer research. And I remember sitting down with John Huntsman, and he looked at me in an interview like this. I have it on video, and he says, whatever you're doing with Qualtronics, <laughs> isn't going to matter because what you're going to do for cancer research is more important. And we brought him, before he passed, five for the fight, 
and said, we're going to crowdsource with $5 for cancer research and raise $50 million, which we've got great news there. And the second, we're going to do it with the MBA. And he's like, wow, I've been looking to do both of those because I love them both. And you brought them both in one thing. We had our very first fight for the fight night. And Ron Boone gets out there in the arena and says, fight for the fight, the jersey patch. And he says, has been donated by Qualtronics. <laughs> and I was just like, OK, I've only heard this twice. And it's just like it's kind of John smiling. Um, and I reminded of that. And then I come up here today. And the only other person that said Qualtronics was Spence Eccles. And so <laughs> I just like, I can't get this like thread. It is just like this nudge from John Huntsman, like, keep doing cancer research. <laughs> and so I don't know. Like, you can't make it up. <laughs> John has spoken at this convocation. And uh, would probably love to talk about Qualtronics. So okay. You know, do you have so, a? <laughs> one quick thing to say on that. After that meeting, I was in an ICM translator, Ryan. I don't think I've ever told you this. He called me and said, Jim, I don't know what on earth he was saying. Because it was about tech, and John didn't even have a PC. And he put, and he had to be look at on TV instead of on his computer. And um, he said, I don't know what Ryan is talking about, but I know he's brilliant, and so we're going to go for it. Thank you. That was a remarkable story. Oh, I just had to say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we've got time for a few questions. And we've got some microphones going around. So if you'd wait, really, Kyle, you want to bring it right down here? We've got a couple right up front. Um, I have to ask, Ryan, what's one piece of advice you'd give someone like I mean, no, no, let me rephrase. Uh, what's one piece of advice that you wish you knew when you were 18? I think um, I talked about this earlier. It's just like you, you all have a chance. Like, you don't understand the impact that other people are going to have on your life. And you know, you hear this sometimes, like prayers are answered through other people, or like everything I have in my life is because someone was like rooting for me. Whether it was like, like every, every single time, like someone like had to like bet here. And I just think you've got to think that life's really long. Your, in, your actions are going to actually follow you forever. And we're all emotional people. We all want to do something. But like, we live in a world where every single thing is now, there's a receipt, <laughs> all right? And so and people naturally, I think, are, humans are good. And like, if I'm 18 years old, like, I want to put myself in as many situations where great people want to bet on me and want to work with me. And I want to go be that. And if you look at all the people who care about you all, like, this is a testament of that. It's like what people want to do naturally. And so collect those people, not NFTs. Right? That's what I said earlier. <laughs> people are going to change your life. And they'll teach you how to go give that back. So that's probably it. Okay, we have a question here from our live stream uh, submitted by Trinity. When entering a field where you don't have much information, what is your mindset to become an expert in that field and what encourages you to keep going? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really good question. I mean, coming into the jazz, like you think you're a fan and you know how things operate. And I mean, it's interesting because like Dwayne Wade came into the organization. He's like, I've been a player. I've been in the league. This is different. Like watching this side of the table, like this is different, <laughs> right? And I was like, all right, we're all going to learn together, right? And then bringing Danny in, it's like, whoa, <laughs> like you have a different level of knowledge of how all this works. And so you think you know, but like when you're, when you're new to an organization um, or new to something, I mean, the, 
the idea is just you've got to be the fastest learner in the building. Period. Hard stop. And like, I, I would challenge everyone here. Like, you want to separate yourself? Be the fastest learner. Doesn't matter where you're from. Doesn't matter your upbringing. Doesn't matter like how much experience you have or who did what internship or where they work. If you are the fastest learner, you will actually win the race. You will outpace everyone because the world is going to an area where there's no playbook. And we need fast learners. We need people who can learn, capture it, and go. And I think that's probably how I would. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to say, hey, I don't know. Like, there's so much I don't know. Like, and I just say it. Like, hey, I'm not, like, I, you know, I'm, I'm a, I major in this, but I'm kind of like a minor in that. Like, I don't know. And like, it's amazing, like, how honesty, it's okay. Say you don't know. Perfect. Another question from the audience. Ryan, thank you for your time. My name is Alex Luiso. Um, in your experience, whether it's hiring uh, Danny with the Jazz or anything in your previous experience, what screening process, whether that's mental or an actual checklist, do you go through with your business partners, and how do you select them? What do you look for? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's the obvious that people always say. It's like, oh, I want to have a beer with them. I like, want to be able to hang out with them. These are people I want to work with. Like, um, I talked about it earlier. It's like I'm always looking at people and saying, hey, first of all, how do they operate when there's no playbook? How do they operate in crisis? Like, when things are going well, everyone's good. When things aren't going well, those are the people that you want to be sitting next to. Um, and that has to do with, like, family, if you're choosing a spouse, a partner. Like, like who do you want to be with? Because the, the lows, definitely, of life seem to outweigh the highs. And we're conditioned as humans to, like, when we get knocked down, to kind of get back up. And you want to be aligned with those people. Um, and when you get that wrong, it's really painful. When people get knocked down, which everyone's going to get knocked down, like Ashley and I call them zingers, where we'll go through the day, and it's like 11 o'clock. And I was like, hey, what's up? Uh, I can already tell. I was like, you had a few zingers this morning? <laughs> it was like, yeah. And it's like, I don't have to say anything else. It's just like. The world you operate, something happens. And in, in school, we had zingers too. Like we were dating, and it's like you'd get a boot on her car all the time. <laughs> and it was like the end of our world. See, parking here is not that bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and like it's not like those are your zingers throughout the day, but like as you get older, the zingers get a little more crazy. And and you want to be with people that are in the zinger business that can handle that. Um, and then, like I said earlier, like you, you, you actually want to hire people, and we are always looking at people that can handle the next two jobs, the next two promotions. That's how we say it. So if we're deciding between candidates, we'll say, who can handle the next two promotions? And so like when we go and hire a first-time coach and Will Hardy, like, that's exciting, because it's like Will's, Will stepped up at everything, like, and someone's got to give him a break, and like, we'll hire it. And, that's awesome. Thanks. One last question we'll take. How about from this side of the, the room? Hi, my name is Max Kelver, and I recently just applied to be a broadcast assistant for the Utah Jazz. Um, <laughs> so I was just wondering any How'd tips. I'm waiting to hear back. I applied yesterday. Hey. So right. well, thought I got the man, record. the myth, the legend right here. I thought I'd hey, yeah, make yeah. my case. So. I was just wondering, any advice you had for me about how to get the job or get further into that process? Um, so that's a part that I haven't learned yet uh, as much, but uh, let's talk. Sure, there's, there's probably a couple of tricks. <laughs> well All done. Right. Very well done. I, I know most of us could probably sit in this room and, and listen to the two of them chat and take questions, but we are going to wrap it up now. Um, I want to say thanks to both Taylor and Ryan. This has been such a treat. It's nice to see 
old-ish friends talking and, and sharing their wisdom, and that's been wonderful. And also to see the thread between Spence and Ryan, um, it's, uh, we're, we're really lucky to have both of you as, uh, as part of our community. So thank you all for coming, and enjoy your afternoon. Thanks.